Well, a very warm welcome. Uh, good evening. Uh, nice to see you all here. So let's see how we go with my first ever chair of this committee. Um, first thing I'd like to do, a bit of housekeeping really, if you've got your phones on, can you put them on silent? Which you've probably all done, or turn them off. Um, as I say, I bought some coffees, so help yourself to coffees down there if you want to uh, do. We're only aware of um, item number one of the apologies at, uh, from Councillor Sarah Daniels and Councillor Peter Thurgood. Uh, we've also got apologies from Jason. Anybody else know of any other apologies or delays because of the traffic? Okay. All right, our next item is to vote for the chair, uh, so vice chair. Uh, and as, as nominations and mover and second is a show, um, vote, show, uh, show of hands and declare the chair. So that's what they did. Richard, I take it that you're uh, pleased to be nominated as vice chair. Very pleased to be nominated. There you go. Okay. So, uh, okay, move. Thank you. Right, our next item on the agenda is the membership of the Audit and Governance Subcommittee. Um, the current membership, I understand, is uh, Councillor Andrew Cooper and Richard Ford, uh, and additional members, question uh, mark. I understand that in 2021-22, the membership was four, including the chair and an opposition member. Um, so, correct me, if I'm wrong, I understand that's been set up to specifically look at the risks of the future High Street Fund project. Um, I'll ask a basic question. Do we still think that it's required as a committee? I'm not a great lover of having committees for the sake of committees, uh, but I'm also conscious that if people are not attending and don't want to attend, if we set a committee and they don't turn up, what's the point of that also? Because we're all busy people and we've all got but I, I, I do believe that that's such an important project that it does need to be monitored, the risk particularly for TBC and all of us, to make sure that we do deliver it on time and, you know. So um, I was quite surprised, and I, I did ask Andrew about the, the, the uh, audit of this, that if the chair of this committee is also the chair of that committee, is it right that they communicate? I don't know whether that, the, the answer to that. I know it might be fine. I'm just saying, is, is it right? I don't know. So, I, you know, going forward, I don't mind chairing it. Richard, you're already on it. Who else wants to volunteer? Now, I, I just say a member of the opposition. Would you like to be on it, Richard? I don't think you're allowed to ask. Oh, I don't know. I'm not part of the meeting. Oh, right, okay. Danny? Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. Yeah, I'd happily move that for the sake of good governance that Sarah Daniels takes up that role uh, because she's the only opposition member on this committee. So I, I think we're kind of pigeonholed on that one. I think it, it is right to have opposition representation on the committee for the sake of governance. Thank you. OK, uh, I guess we'll uh, write to them and put a list. Ah. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I'd uh, second that as well. Okay. Uh, item four is the minutes held on the meeting of the meeting held on the twenty first of twenty second of March, twenty twenty. Um, if there was no comments or I suppose corrections or whatever, can I ask for a mover and a second? Um, okay. Richard, yeah. move second. Tick. Um, item five is a de declaration of interests. Um, I, uh, well, it says invite councillors to speak if they have any declaration of interest. No? Okay. And to remind councillors that it is their responsibility to leave the meeting before the commencement of any item which they may have an interest in. So I think we're all aware of that. Tick. Uh, right. Item six is the role of the audit committee. And I'd now like to invite our auditors to make a short presentation. Uh, 
Oh, I need to switch you on. Approve. Mr Snooty. Thank you, Chair. So, hello, everyone. My name is William Guest, and I'm an audit manager from Grant Thornton, who do the external audit for the Council. So, we've prepared some slides to inform you of your role as audit committee. So, if you could please turn to the next slide. On this slide, we'll talk through what we're going to go through in the whole of this item. So, these are SIPFA's definition of the purpose of an audit committee, roles and responsibilities of the audit committee, features of an effective audit committee, the difference between scrutiny and audit committees, roles of assurance providers, what external auditors do, and reporting requirements. If you could please turn to the next slide. SIFA's definition is shown on this slide, but the key points to note here are that the committee is there to provide independent assurance of adequacy of the risk management framework and control environment, provide independent scrutiny of the financial and non-financial performance of the council, oversee financial reporting processes and review the effectiveness of the systems of internal audit. So if you could please turn to the next slide. Your roles and responsibilities are set out here and they are as follows. So to oversee and assess the Council's risk management arrangements, control environment and anti-fraud and anti-corruption arrangements. You will also advise the Council on the adequacy and effectiveness of these. You will also seek assurance that action is being taken on any risks that have been identified. Be satisfied that the authorities' assurance statements reflect the risk environment and actions required to improve it, and approve the internal audit strategy, plan and monitor performance. If you go to the next slide, please. So features of an effective audit committee include knowing which specialist to call upon when you need advice, ensure members are aware of key items uh, that inform their work, Members should be independent of other key committees and meetings should be free, open and not hindered by political influence. If we could go to the next slide, please. So scrutiny and audit committees sometimes get confused and this slide highlights some of the differences between the two committees. So scrutiny are there to review processes and challenge whether the correct decisions have been taken by executives. Audit is there to provide independent assurance over the controls that are in place to mitigate any key risks. An audit committee may be informed by results of scrutiny activity within the authority. If we could go to the next slide. So there are some common misconceptions and these centre around what the audit committee should do. The audit committee is there to give assurance across these areas and call on experts when needed. The audit committee is not there to do the work, but to monitor and challenge management. If we could go to the next slide, please. So two assurance providers to the committee are internal audit and external audit. Internal audit are there to provide an independent opinion on the governance, risk management and internal control of the council. External audit undertakes an audit and reports an opinion on whether the financial statements are true and fair. And we also provide a value for money conclusion, uh, which states whether the council has proper arranged in place to secure financial resilience and economy efficiency and effectiveness. If we go to the next slide, please. So the council is responsible for preparing financial statements and the AGS. The council also is responsible for putting in place arrangements to secure economy efficiency and effectiveness in its use of resources. The scope of our work is to audit the 21, 22 financial statements and give a conclusion on whether the council has achieved value for money. The next slide uh, details our reporting requirements and Lauren will be presenting the audit plan in the next agenda item, but as you can see, we'll also be bringing other reports throughout the year as our audit progresses. And then the final slide sets out some questions for you to consider when you as those charged with governance, oh, sorry, next slide. I didn't realise it was a little subheading. Um, some for you to consider as those charged with governance that you may want to ask when reviewing the financial statements. And that was all, so I'm happy to take any questions from the committee. Right, um, well, thank you for that. Um, there's a couple of things that I pick up as a new newbie to this. Um, you said there was um, knowing that you can call upon a specialist for advice. Is that a listed group of specialists? Do we, so we know who we can contact, or do we contact you and then you advice? I don't know. Nobody knows. 
Um, the answer to that question is very much going to depend on the circumstances. So there will be things where your first port of call might be myself or Will. There'll be things where your first port of call might be um, sort of Stefan or one of the directors, and there'd be um, things where your first port of call might be internal audit. So it's it's it would depend on the circumstances, which I know is not the most helpful answer. <laughs> um, but it's that's why it's important that there are kind of clear lines of communication between the sort of key um, players in that in that environment. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I think I can possibly help with that question a little bit. Uh, my advice is uh, go through Democratic Services or the Chief Executive. If the issue is, for some reason, and God forsake it ever happened with the Chief Executive, and you haven't got that avenue, that's what the Chief Officer Conduct Committee is for, or the Monitoring Officer. So my best advice is through de Democratic Services or by the Chief Executive. They'll always get you the answer you need. Thank you. And, and thank you for that um, synopsis. It's, it's very good. Uh, right, our next item is the audit plan, and I'm going to invite... Thank you, Chair. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, for those of you who I haven't met before, my name is Laurelyn Griffiths. I'm a director at Grant Thornton. I am the engagement lead for the external audit, so I am the person that signs the Council's audit opinion for this year. Um, so this item is our audit plan for the 21-22 financial year, so the financial year that ended in March. Um, I am going to take the plan as read, but just kind of run through the key highlights and the things that you really need to, to know. Um, so starting on page 17 of the pack, uh, the plan does set out what we consider to be the significant risks uh, for the audit. So these are significant risks of material misstatement within the financial statements. Um, under the auditing standards, there are two presumed significant risks, which we set out here. So the first one is that there is a presumed risk that there is fraud within the recognition of income. Um, and in public sector, there's a sort of an addendum to that where we have to also consider expenditure. That presumed risk is rebuttable. And for the council, we have we have rebutted that. Um, we generally tend to rebut that across most local government bodies, uh, just because of the nature of the income and the nature of the sector that you're in. The second presumed risk under the auditing standards is non-rebuttable, and that is the risk that management are overriding the controls that are in place. So we do specific tests uh, to address to address that risk and to consider whether we think that those, those things are happening. The remaining two significant risks are effectively the two largest numbers in the financial statements, so the valuation of the council's properties and the valuation of the council's pension liability. So they are very big numbers and they are estimates, so there is just inherently risk of error in those numbers. Um, a few pages later, we do detail our materiality threshold, so page 24 of the pack. Um, so we've set our materiality threshold for this year as 1.15 million, which is the same as it was last year. Um, and lower than that, we also set a threshold for uh, what we consider to be a clearly trivial matter, um, which is £57,000 for Tamworth. Anything that we identify during the audit that is above that clearly trivial threshold will be reported as part of our reporting processes. Um, our value for money uh, planning is ongoing. We, we do effectively a rolling risk assessment for the entire year up until the point that we issue our auditor's annual report. Um, so we have not yet uh, identified any risks of significant weakness for the value for money work. Um, the auditor's annual report for this year uh, should be uh, reported within three months of the audit opinion. So we would be looking to issue that uh, by December, hopefully. <laughs> All going well. Um, and then the final few pages just set out um, some logistics and some information on fees. So I think it's worth noting that we are... Uh, hoping this year, well, we're working on the assumption this year that we'll be able to be on site at the council with finance team members for uh, three days a week, I think is the plan, which we're hoping will make this year's audit a much smoother process than last year's. Um, the audit fee is, is broadly consistent with the previous year. You will have noticed probably that there has been a slight change in the fees for the um, additional work that we do on some of the council's grants. And that's as a result of um, we've effectively undertaken a rebasing of our fees across the local government uh, to um, make sure that we are appropriately charging for the work that we are doing. That was all I was proposing to say, unless anybody has any questions. Thank you. 
Yeah, right. Yeah. So I assume that if there's no more questions, everybody will be happy. And, oh, Danny? Got a raft of questions, Mr Chairman, if I may. <laughs> uh, do you want me to take one at a time? Or I don't know if anybody else had any questions. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, apologies if this comes across strong. It's not meant to. It's just... Um, and the 151 office of Mr Garner will be fund fundamentally aware of my views on language and finance and audit is very misleading. This council operates to perform for the public. A public reading this will have no clue what we do. <laughs> no clue. I'll give you a perfect example. Local government funding continues to be stretched in increasing cost pressures and demand from residents. As at the period nine, the council had a favourable variance in the general fund of 9.087 million. Having monitored our budgets for the last 15 years, this is not a favourable variance in that language. It's not. We're, this council is in no better position because of the grants we received through COVID. So I'm just, I've got a real question about the language being used. Giving, that's giving me an impression this council is £9 million better off. That is not the case, is it? But that's my first question, Mr Chairman. Yep, thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, you're quite correct. It's not a, a positive news story in terms of the council's budget. What it is, it's a reflection, um, and the, the auditors have pulled that from our uh, monthly uh, financial monitoring report that shows we've received uh, COVID grants to, to, to pay for the additional business rights reliefs in the main of that amount more than we expected. But obviously on the council side, we've got to give that out in relief to business, local businesses. So it's a net, it should be a net sort of zero cost or uh, income to the council. But yeah, you're quite right. It, it, it is, it, it, it's, it's misleading, yes. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Chair. So I, I know it's the type of language used uh, in finance and accounts. I'm, I'm an operations manager by trade. I make things go from A to B. So, you know, I use straight language. And I know when you're talking SIP for code of practice and financial practices, that there is a language used sometimes. But it just concerns me sometimes that these are public documents. The public can open this. And the first thing the public would say from that statement is, how are you £9 million better off or we're not? And I just get very concerned sometimes about that language. And it's just the point I wanted to raise. Can I have a, another question, please, Mr Chairman? Uh, I did try Googling this several times today because I've never come across the term. Materiality, well, what is it? <laughs> Um, so, materiality is, uh, it's effectively a threshold that we use to drive our auditing. Um, so, under the auditing standards, we're required to consider at what level we think an error would have to be in the accounts that would effectively change the way that a reader would interpret them. Um, so, that, that 1.15 million, we think that if there were an error that big in the financial statements, that would fundamentally change the way that the reader would interpret the financial statements. And that would then not be a true and fair representation of the council's performance and position. Um, we then do set um, a lower threshold, which we call performance materiality. So that's then the threshold at which we kind of perform our testing so that there is a, like a safety net between those two thresholds so that we should find everything that would, would lead to a material error. Um, obviously that's, in theory, because all of our work is based on kind of sample testing and we don't look at absolutely everything. Um, and then we set that clearly trivial threshold so that there is that transparency in reporting so that if there were things that we had identified that management had chosen not to um, amend in the financial statements, um, you would have the opportunity to, to challenge that decision. And also if there are things we've identified that management have amended, you still see that those, those results of the process Yeah, I'm just looking for a clarification on that as well. Obviously, it says that, um, like you say, 1.15 million, which is 1.95% of the overall spend. I assume that includes um, both HRA general fund and both capital budgets, because otherwise I can't make the maths work. So it's a percentage of the, um, the, the revenue expenditure, so the general fund and the HRA expenditure. Yeah, uh, just help me again. Like I said, I've never sat an audit in governance before. Um, what's a narrative report? 
that one's a nice question, I can answer that one. Um, so the narrative report is effectively the front half of the documents that the financial statements sit in. So it's, it's, it's the narrative section of the report. So it's the council presenting uh, sort of how it believes the year went and, and how like putting the financial statements into context, as it were. Thank you. Uh, right, item number nine is the uh, annual governance statement and code of corporate governance. Uh, and I now invite uh, Andrew to present. Um, item eight, which is the, um, the, the Ripper report first. Oh. Thank you, Chair. Um, purpose of this report um, is to um, update the committee on any um, covert surveillance that has been undertaken um, under the regulation of Investigatory Powers Act 2000. We have a number of statutory functions um, that involve officers investigating conduct of others with a view to bringing legal action. And with the councillors being given these powers under the RIPA uh, 2000, and it is a legal framework for the control of regulation of surveillance specifically covert surveillance and information gathering techniques. Um, following the constitutional review in 2020, any policy updates are now approved by the Audit and Governance Committee, where identified. Um, the, uh, the, slightly, the updated um, annual review is attached with the report, um, and there has been no directed um, covalent no covalent, goodness me. No directed surveillance carried out by the council during 21-22, and there's been no authorisations for the use of covert human intelligence sources. Uh, it's worth pointing out that the use of RIPA is now um, only undertaken where the um, penalty for any offences is a six-month custodial sentence. Um, so at this point in time, as I say, there has been none, and there's no like to be no changes for the foreseeable future. And really, it's asking for a recommendation that the Audit and Governance Committee endorse the RIPA monitoring report for 2021 22. Thank you. Right, I'll get back to item number nine now, which is the annual governance statement and code of corporate governance. Andrew. Th thank you, Chair. Um, this is um, a requirement that under the Accounts and Audit Regulations that every year um, that the leader and myself have to sign um, a governance statement which goes into our accounts to uh, say that you know, effectively we are satisfied with the, the proper practices and governance within the authority. Uh, the statement for this year is attached at Appendix 1. Um, it, still, it highlights uh, three areas of um, sort of significant, we call significant governance issues, uh, which are the same as last year, uh, namely the medium term financial strategy, um, our capital um, and regeneration projects, and our welfare benefit reform uh, areas, which are areas of big spend and quite um, particularly MTFS is reliant on other factors as well as, uh, as, well as the council. Moving on from that, we also have our code of corporate governance, which is our sort of our, our commitment to ensure we have the, uh, the highest possible standards of, uh, of good governance within the authority. Uh, this is quite a, a, a weighty document, um, but I'm pleased to say there's been no um, significant issues identified within it. And uh, this year's reviews identify that the council's governance arrangements largely comply with, uh, with, with best practice. So um, I think all, all in all, it's, uh, it's a good, fair assessment of, of where the organisation is from a government's perspective. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, I did read it. Um, right, item number 10, which is to re review the Treasury management... Sorry, Chair. Uh, oh, yes. Sorry, the, the, these items do, I think, need moving and seconding and voting on. Ah, oh, right. Okay. Yeah. There you go. I'm up. May I ask somebody to move, second, and then we'll have a vote upon that. Thank you. 
Vote. Right. We can now move on then to review the Treasury Management Strategy Statement, Minimum Revenue Policy Provision Policy Statement and the Annual Investment Statement and the Treasury Management Strategy Statement and Annual Investment Strategy Mid-Year Review. <laughs> Steph, Steph. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, the Treasury Management Code of Practice requires that the Council nominate an appropriate committee to scrutinise its Treasury Management activities and Council, full Council, have approved that this committee scrutinise the strategy and policies as well as receive a, receiving regular monitoring reports. With regard to ensuring effective scrutiny of the Treasury Management strategy and policies, the report outlines the code's suggestions, which are detailed in the report, and, and this involves reviewing the, the policy and procedures and making recommendations to the responsible body, which is Cabinet. Uh, public service organisations have a, a responsibility to ensure that those charged with governance, i.e. this committee, have access to the skills and knowledge that they require to carry out their role effectively and we do have regular treasury management training for, for all members. Those charged with governance also have a, a personal responsibility to ensure that, that they have the appropriate skills and training in their role. Uh, the procedures for monitoring treasury activities through audit, scrutiny and inspection should be sound and rig rigorously applied with openness and access to information and well-defined arrangements for review and implementation of recommendations for change. Uh, and this includes the provision of monitoring information and regular review by councillors in both executive, i.e. cabinet and scrutiny functions. In compliance with the above, a, a copy of the, the strategy for 22-23 and the mid-year monitoring report for 21-22 are attached as appendices. Happy to take any questions and suggested uh, or if there's any suggested amendments to, to recommend to Cabinet, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right, I'll ask uh, any questions first. Danny. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I think um, Mr Garner hit it on the head um, in his introduction there. Um, you know, as we are the nominators committee that then feeds into Cabinet for the Treasury Management function, it's essential that, you know, we are trained. Yeah. Well, if you look on the actual strategy at 1.4, where it does mention training, it's just something I think this council needs to fix very, very quickly. Four members of a seven-person committee that is us have never had this training, ever, because they weren't elected the last time this council held this training. I think we need to accelerate how quick we do treasury management training, because over half of the Audit and Governance Committee has not had the training, because they were all elected after 2019. Sorry, um, we, we put on Treasury Management Training this year. I, th I, think, I think you're looking at probably the, the report that went in December. Obviously, we've, we've done training since then. We had that's, it in... that's, that's what we've lost, that's 2019. Yes, yeah, but they're, they're reports, they're sort of historic reports. So um, we've, we've, we have put on the, the training since, yeah, it was in February. Thank you. May I ask if there's any more training? I mean, as a new man on the block, so to speak, what is the plan for this year's training? Um, we, we carry out treasury training every, probably on average, every every two years. But we can we can put on treasury training later in the year if if the committee uh, suggests it, which I think. Uh, Councillor Cook is so yeah. We're yeah, going to yeah I agree. I agree with that. To yeah. be perfectly honest, I think that uh, the more training and the more information yeah. we get, we've got. Um, you know, it's a big budget. It's a big. Lo it's a, it's a critical part of where we're going in the next couple of years, particularly with the high street fund and the expenditure. So. Was... Yeah, we can arrange that, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I've pulled this from a couple of points. Uh, obviously, on page eight, looking at the CFR. And later on again in page 11 but mostly drawing it out on page 29 hra debt which obviously is the reform debt for the purchase of the council houses we already owned in the first place but that's a side debate 
Obviously, we had to borrow from the government sixty odd million pounds to buy the council houses that technically we already owned in the first place in two thousand and eleven. What, what I'm curious about is we set out in two thousand and eleven on a very direct theory that we would cover the interest, but for now not really pay back the loan because that allowed us to regenerate Tinker's Green Carrier, um, you know, pay for other capital projects. What I'm curious about is obviously on page twenty nine, I'm looking at HRA debt, and it's slightly increasing over the next five years, year on year. And obviously, I thought that went against the principle of where we started. I'm just curious why it's going up. Thank you, Chair. So there's, there's two issues here. You're quite right. We, we, we uh, councillors, um, full council, made that decision not to repay debt and to invest what we would have repaid the debt, those funds we would have repaid the debt with, into regeneration projects and investment in the stock, which we are still doing year on year. So there's, there's no plans in the current strategy or the MTFS to repay housing debt. The, the same strategy here still applies, we're investing that in, in the council housing stock. The reason why the, the debt is increasing in, in uh, the next few years or planned increases is because there's a, a borrowing need in the capital programme to, to uh, uh, you know, the, the amount of spend exceeds funds available. So. Um, and as you know, we're, we're quite entitled to, or the council is quite entitled to borrow to fund capital expenditure where it needs to, and it can do for, for the HRA. Uh, and that's just um, where uh, we, we need to borrow, especially in the later years of the programme, where we, we're adding in uh, significant amounts of potential spend, I'll say at this stage, for green initiatives, uh, net carbon neutral initiatives. And that's where that, that big... Uh, borrowing need arises because there, there isn't enough funding within the HRA to fund that uh, initially, but we'll borrow for that and repay that over, you know, the next 50 years or so. Yeah, follow up if I may then. Uh, sorry, I, I genuinely can't remember from February. Uh, it's slipped slip my mind. Um, what, what is the balances at the end of the five years in the HRA in revenue? It's roughly two point something, about two million, just under two million pounds from memory. So, yeah, and so the follow up question, I think Stefan knows where I'm about to go here. <laughs> if we've got two million imbalances in the revenue account and you can make revenue contributions to capital, why we've got a need to borrow what looks like a total of 300,000 pounds at the end of year five? Sorry. It, it, it's more than that. I think, I think the borrowing need was in the millions. So we've so obviously we, we treat capital and, and revenue separately, but you're quite right. We can co contribute t towards the capital program from the HRA. At the time we set the capital program, uh, or we're pulling the capital program together, it was unsure how much we would have left in, in HRA balances. So we put it in a, as a borrowing need, but you're quite right. When we review it again, uh, this year's budget process, we, we can adjust that out. And, and, uh, but obviously, taking into account the, the, the minimum level of HRA balances we, we, that we need to keep uh, in it all re respects anyway. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. <laughs> so this is the regular quarterly risk management update for the committee for quarter four of the 21-22 financial year. A copy of the current corporate risk register is attached at Appendix A and shows that there has been little change on the risk register for the last quarter. As previously reported, the peer review has been removed and will be restated when it is rescheduled. The Operational Risk Champions Group have met to discuss cross-service risks and they report items of significance that could affect the strategic risks. 
The recent meeting of the group highlighted the growing impact of supply shortages and increased costs as a result of inflationary impacts now exacerbated by the war in Ukraine. The cost of living crisis could also impact collection rates for council tax and housing rents and other income. These pressures will be monitored and measures to mitigate the risks will be taken where possible. I'm happy to take any questions and also ask that the committee endorses the report. Thank you. I'll ask, I'll ask a silly question. What are the mitigation plans or strategies? Sorry, did you say what? <coughs> you said that you're going to mitigate the risk. What are the plans you've got to mitigate if people are not, can't afford to pay, won't pay, etc.? Well, obviously, we will keep those under review and, and monitor them and report them through the year. Um, it's a bit difficult to say at this moment in time what steps we can take. Um, at the moment, we haven't really noticed that there has been much in impact in terms of collection rates. They're still relatively good at the moment. We've, okay. we've got a good performance, but obviously, we will Did keep those under review. Yeah, do you set a KPI to say, you know, if it gets above 1%, 10% or a value? We do have performance measures for our collection rates. So I think for council tax and NNDR, they're up in the high 90s. Um, so at the moment, as I say, we're, we're still within okay. our yeah, I'm targets. just anticipating, you know, the future. We're all expecting, you know, two pound a gallon and lots of gas bills going up, et cetera, that there, there could be a pinch in everybody's pocket. Okay, thank you. Any, any more questions? <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, just one question that may expand into three or four, if, if you don't know how it goes. Obviously, on the corporate risk summary page, you obviously got uh, finance and financial stability, governance, community focus, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And nearly every single one of them at the minute is in yellow. And I understand why they're in yellow. That's fine. The only one that's currently sat in green on the little grid is modernisation and commercial agenda. And I would question that we're in green on the commercial agenda. I would really question that, especially if you go dig into the details on page five and six, where there's two big red flags in it. You know, slow or no progress on the um, co commercial investment strategy, underutilization of assets, and you come down, and obviously there's two red flags. I question how we've managed to mark that one in green, because I would question that slightly. I, you know, obviously come from the commercial sector, and obviously I know the public sector and the private sector is an entirely different game with a different way of swimming up the stream. But I don't think we're quite there on commercialisation yet, and I don't think we can say as a council we're there yet. So I, I question that one being in green, and I was looking for some clarification. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, the, the risk scores, um, I mean, that's part of the role of this committee is to challenge those risk, risk scores. So we've, we've scored our, our gross risk in the green and then the following mitigations, it's also in the green. To be honest, I think I agree with you. It probably, given the, the, uh, the impact of the pandemic on our commercial uh, approach, although we, we have... We have um, done some stuff towards our commercial approach. It, it, it's not gone as, uh, as quickly as we, we thought because it has been delayed. Um, so, yeah, I'd probably agree that we probably need, do need to review that risk score and, and, uh, and probably push it into the amber. Uh, just to clarify, though, Mr Chairman, to Mr Gowan and Mr Barrett, that's not to say the officers of this council have not delivered on um, projects and commercialisation. I think we've took some long steps in the correct direction. I just don't think we're in green at the minute. And I think I'm just being honest by saying it. So it wasn't a challenge or an attack. It's just asking how did we get to green there, because I, I wouldn't, wouldn't agree with that at the moment. Yeah, we'll uh, now seek to uh, move that report and get it second and vote show of hands. Danny. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Right, shall we show of hands? Move on the agenda item. Could I just ask you to take a vote on agenda item eight? So we didn't do that just for completeness, because that's, uh, oh, that's the, uh, the, the regulation of investigative powers report. Thank you.
Right, um, we'll move swiftly on to item 13, our internal audit annual report and the quarterly update. Uh, and I in 12? Oh, yeah, I've missed one. Uh, there you go, sorry about that. An update on um, the new updated LGA model code of conduct. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, this report is to um, update members on the local government association model, uh, the LGA Code of Conduct. Um, it's in response to some recommendations and a report from the Office of Standards in Public Life. Um, the uh, report um, was first published, the Code of Conduct was first published um, back in early 2021. Um, since then, we've had further guidance and support through the LGA um, as recent as this year uh, with some training material. Um, and what we'd like to do is bring it to your attention in the view of reviewing our current Code of Conduct um, under the Localism Act 2011. Um, there is no requirement to adopt or to implement a new Code of Conduct. Um, but it's the view um, to this report to um, review our current code of conduct that's in place um, and welcome obviously the timetable in order to do that. Sorry. <laughs> It is fit for purpose. Um, we are covered with the new with the code of conduct, but this is a new uh, code that's been published and commissioned in response to the Ethical Standards uh, Committee a report back in 2019. Yeah, you stole my question there, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> what was wrong with the old one? Um, yeah, but just to follow up from that. And again, I'm sounding like I'm the difficult one tonight. I think the office offers offers offers. We know I'm actually not that difficult usually, but uh, I won't be voting for any of this, Mr. Chairman. And I'll, I'll I'll take you through why. First recommendation that members note the new LGA model code of conduct. When members are asked to note something, what we're accepting is we've read it. I haven't read it. Yeah, I've scanned read it, but you know to actually understand the code of conduct. How long we had these papers? What seven, ten days? I can't, I can't tell you I understand what I'm being asked for in seven, ten days. One of the matters of importance of a code of conduct. So then I can't say, agree with the second one, it says we need to do a review and this committee support the review. I can't say that at the minute. I need to compare the two. I don't know what the differences are. I don't know what's changing. I've had no, no basis to understand what I'm being asked to vote on here. Uh, you know, a number of workshops, yes, but we've already set it in motion before the workshop. So I might get to the workshop and go, why have I voted for this? Hang on, we don't need to change this. So I don't feel in a place tonight where I can know where I'm fully voting for because I haven't perused what the changes are, what the difference would be, why do we need to change it? Corporately, how does it improve us? As a councillor, how does it hold me more to account? To the public and the taxpayer, is it better for them? I, I don't understand any of those things when I say I accept I've read it and I accept that we might need to change it. I, I, I can't sit here this evening and say that. I want a good month to sit and compare these two. It's too big a question for me to have seven days to try and get to it. It's too big a question for me, so I cannot support this report, Mr Chairman, but I'm happy to be challenged by any officer opposite on that. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, very interesting points from Danny, and listening to that, that, that is a very persuasive argument. Uh, I would suggest that we potentially defer items number one and two. I'm happy to support recommendations three and four, uh, which were, the, no, note the timetable and um, the other two. Um, Mr Chairman, I think it might be appropriate uh, if, through you, uh, Demo Services and the Monetary Officer for a training session of some kind where uh, the Monetary Officer runs through the changes with the whole council, I guess, uh, um, just to make sure everybody fully understands it um, and obviously gives members of this committee the time to digest it fully. Yes, I fully agree. I mean, to be honest, looking at it, I've wrote on here that I think it's time to just defer it, give us a bit of time, understand where we're going from, where we're coming from, where we need to be. Uh, so just to, to defer it and do some training. Uh, and and I, I noticed from the commercial side, particularly since COVID, there is such a working from home hasn't been good for a lot of businesses. But there's a lot of people that have stopped the four inches between their ear holes working and they need time to, you know, adjust. And I think as a council, we need time to, you know, go in a committee. We're all new. You know, 
where code of conduct and practice is, is, is critical. So I'd, I'd like to, again, back that suggestion of let's just d defer it, let's get some training properly in process, and when we can review it in, I don't know, a couple of months or whenever. When's the next meeting of this committee? Is it September? August. So I don't know whether that's, we can, sorry. Yeah, we can do that, Chair. We can timetable some. I mean, if it's some, uh, time, then we'll move it further. But I think all this is probably really important. So helpful to the committee. I mean, as, um, as the monitoring officer said, you know, we don't have to adopt the new code. Our, our current code is, is fit for purpose. I think having a, a workshop event first to appraise all members of exactly the differences are, what does it mean, the benefit, the pros, cons, so members can then debate that. We've got a draft timetable contained within reports. Um, should the outcome of that be yes, we believe we do need to look at some other things, then that can come back to this committee um, broadly in line with it. So um, if, if that's helpful to, to the committee, I think that will be um, a, a good starting point. I <clears throat> Sorry, I think uh, for the governance, one should move that we defer the, accepting the recommendations. I don't know, Joe's just nodded at me. Uh, she'd be shouting at uh, all of us if we didn't. Uh, so, yeah, I'm happy to defer it. And uh, on the timetable, the, the additional timetable that we've laid out that we do a training session uh, for all members. Thank you. So yes, the, the purpose of the report uh, attached is to, to report to members uh, the, of the committee internal audits annual report for 21-22, which is attached to Appendix 1 and includes quarter four performance to the 31st of March 2022. Internal audits opinion on the Council's uh, framework of governance, risk management and internal control is that it is reasonable in its overall design and effectiveness. They have highlighted certain weaknesses and exceptions uh, arising from their work, uh, which have been discussed with management and recommendations made for, for improvements. All of these have been or in the process of being addressed. No specific, specific issues have been highlighted through the audit work undertaken during the year. Um, a couple of highlights from the report. During last financial year, internal audit completed 80% of the audit plan but that was against a target of 90%. That was due to um, issues uh, arising during the year. If, if, if uh, members uh, will remember, we had um, vacancies in the year, including the audit manager for, for the first portion, portion of the year, and delays in procuring IT audit and general auditor services. Um, total outstanding actions at the end of the quarter four are 93. Um, and at the 31st of March, there were 24 high priority recommendations, um, of which 16 were overdue. Uh, however, as part of the follow up since the end of the quarter four, internal audits have identified that all of those have been uh, completed or, and closed off, apart from three, uh, which are detailed in the report. Uh, there's one uh, recommendation in the report for members' endorsement. Happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you. Uh, yes, Mr Chairman, and this is said tongue-in-cheek. Uh, this is another recommendation I cannot support, and the officers opposite will know why. I will never, ever vote for a recommendation that says I know something, because all I'm accepting is I've read it. I'd happily move the recommendation we endorse it. <laughs> Because, yeah, all you ever do when you note something as a committee, you accept you've read it. What are you actually saying? So if you just change it to endorse, I'll happily move the recommendation, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, just reading through this report, it's something I raised last year um, with regards to the outstanding audit recommendations. You will only ever show 12 months a snapshot in a graph for, for a 
um, processes that rely on so much on assurance and audit. I'd like to see a longer five-year plan of, uh, of, of how what we've done with audit uh, recommendations. Are we improving as a council or are we getting worse over a five-year period? A 12-month sn uh, snapshot showing uh, outstanding audit recommendations just isn't enough to show trend. Yeah, that's yeah, completely agree. Um, we, we can show that to, uh, on a longer time frame. Just for, for members' interest, when um, going back a couple of years, we uh, since we've been sort of including the graph in the, the, the uh, internal audit report, those recommendations started off at about 370. So it has, it has substantially improved since that. But we can show, we'll, we'll show that on the graph at the next meeting. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, I, I fully concur with that. My colleagues were saying that a year is no good, really. We, if we're looking at strategy and a longer term for this place and Tamworth, we, we, you know, even a 10, 12 year, whatever, that we should be looking at, are they going in? And it's okay saying that it started off with 300 on a list and they're down to 10 or whatever, but you may just not put them on the list. So, again, you know, I'm just asking some, you know, excuse the obvious questions. If we're going to measure ourselves on, in audit, we need to be honest and brutally honest with ourselves are we doing a good job and are we ticking these boxes correctly um you know and, and, and again you know i haven't read it in full so maybe that's the timing that we didn't get enough time to digest all this information maybe it's the way it's presented on emails and we're all busy people i don't know but maybe that's something else we can look at the audit that you know when we dis disseminate information how is it received do we have any feedback to say that people have read it, understand it, are trained on, you know, and are better people to move forward with this? So maybe that's something we can talk about. Sorry, Richard. Mr. Chairman, you just raised a very, very interesting point. Uh, audit has the longest report out of any committee. Um, and I'll be turning to uh, uh, the chief exec here. Is it possible to get the, the, the statutory requirements five, five working days before? Is it possible to have the agenda for audit published earlier or for the members to get the, the reports ahead of time. So as the chairman's just met, just raised, they are incredibly long reports. Uh, all of us have full-time jobs uh, to, to fully give the reports the, the due attention they deserve, uh, rather than skim reading all of them. Thank you, Chair. Um, at risk of being very unpopular um, with, with committee, um, the timetable is set out thus. So we know when the committee dates are we aim to publish seven days before. Um, it's very tight to do that. Um, you know, we, we, we haven't got um, spare resource to enable us to accelerate things like that. But we can say the reports will be published on this date prior to the meeting. So I think members are aware of when the reports will be published. They're aware of when the committee dates are there. So there is a, a time period that you know may, maybe we have to work together. I'll, I'll certainly discuss with um, you know with the audit manager any possibility, but I I do genuinely think it's, it's it's a big ask, and I think certainly with you know with the I won't say limited resource, we have sufficient resource, but we just have sufficient resource to accelerate that would um, would probably be um, you know not achievable. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, um, just on the uh, back of uh, Chief Executive points, I'm absolutely sympathetic to, you know, the capacity, you know, we've just been through austerity, extra, but I'm really sympathetic to Councillor Ford's point as well. Fully understand, you know, officers go work very hard to get their papers ready for a particular time to get them out to committee members. Mm. But just to add on to the risk, and we were talking the risk venture earlier, it won't stop me, and I think anybody else, sometimes saying to you, I've not had enough time with this report. Mm. And then the last thing we want to hear is, well, if you don't vote for it tonight, the council's in serious trouble. Mm. That, that's the danger we face here because I will never vote for a report I have not digested and understood as I've just demonstrated this evening. That's always my risk when you've got an agenda like this. And I, like I say, you know, I think it's 95% of the councillors on Tamworth Public Council have full-time jobs. It's getting through papers like this in a week is an incredible difficult thing to do. And I don't like voting for things I don't understand. You know, I fully agree. I mean, I'm looking at it as a, you know, a, a, a new guy to it. And I'm thinking there's information overload. There's a lot of jargon in there. Um, 
you're right about resources and limited finances and etc. Um, but I did speak and I met with with Andrew per, deliberately to shake hands. I don't believe that the zooms are the answer really, um, but that's a personal personal thing. Um, and one thing that was obvious from our conversation was his job is shared with Litchfield, and I personally don't think that's a big enough. I think that role needs to be increased for Tamworth particularly when you look at governance uh, and audit, it is really, really critical that we have it properly managed. And maybe the resource has been assessed to be right. I don't know. My own view, I wouldn't say it was, because looking at all this and the way it reads, I would say them reports are far too long. They need to come out perhaps twice, three times a year at different... So we've got, you know, different times to read them and understand them. Just as comment... Right, so um, we're not going to um, agree, are we, that we've read them and understood them and know all about them. Um, but certainly, um, I do need to move in second, I suppose, don't I? Yeah, Sorry? Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Right, um, item. Ah, shall we put that to the vote? <laughs> yeah. I'll... Right, now on to item 14. The public sector internal audit standards dash quality assurance and improvement programme. Now, uh, again, this is uh, over to you. Thank, thank you, Chair. Yeah, th this is, um, again, another requirement. Um, this is to ensure that our own internal audit uh, process complies with the public sector, in, uh, public sector internal audit standards and also the, the quality assurance and improvement programme. Um, compliance is required under the Accounts and Audit Regulations um, and it ensures that inter internal audit complies with um, professional best, best practice and assesses themselves against the requirement on an annual basis. Um, the audit manager has done this. This is attached at um, Appendix 1, and it demonstrates that, um, in his opinion, uh, we are compliant with it. And further, there is a, a, a quality assurance and improvement plan set out, um, which is in Appendix 2. Um, no actions have been carried forward from last year's review, and no further actions have been identified this year, which is good. Uh, part of the overall external quality um, assessment in this is the fact we, we have to have this externally validated or externally approved every five years. This was done uh, last in 2017, so it is required this year. Um, we will have to procure an external assessor who will come in uh, and do a, a desktop exercise to ensure our compliance with the PS, um, uh, IAS. Um, obviously, the committee will be involved uh, in that process uh, just to give surety that um, we are indeed compliant in our own internal processes. So it's, uh, it's, it's an important piece of, piece of work. Yeah, and obviously the big thing there is the important pr improvement programme. You, you know, we need to not just copy what we've done in the past, but improve on it. OK, uh, again, um, so a recommendation for the rule. I seek a move. I think. Thank you. Second. Show of hands. Right, we're moving. Uh, now, um, item 15. Uh, as, I, as you uh, are all aware, um, unfortunately, Andrew has been detained but, uh, and won't be here tonight. So um, I would suggest or I would propose that this item is deferred to our uh, next meeting. Um, for the benefit of those who weren't on the committee last year, a number of important questions were asked at the last committee um, uh, that we wanted a, a reference to in terms of the, the appointment of an independent person. Um, would it be possible, Mr Chairman, for you to get Andrew to circulate with the committee the answer to those questions, which will, he, will, he'll be, he, will, he will be aware of, yeah. uh, just so uh, the process is seen to be uh, moving forward in our eyes because uh, I believe the 
interviews were meant to be happening this month, or so is my recollection from the last uh, <clears throat> uh, meeting. Uh, Andrew just set out a, a, a timetable, and I just like reassurances that it's on time. Okay, I'll, well, um, I'll ask him. Yes, we'll, we'll, we'll it's, it's a family business, family thing today. So, yeah, so, 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 so yeah, we'll, I'm, I'm sure he's on top of it. Thank you. Um, Right, item six is the audit and government's committee timetable discussion. Uh, well, I guess you're all aware of the timetable and meetings and agendas. Uh, are there any concerns or comments or actions that you want? Yeah, Chair. I, um, to be honest, I, th I think you've you. You hit the nail on the head with, with thinning out some of the agendas. I think so that we can we can have a good focus on what we're being presented. I think we do we do need to have a look at that agenda. I mean, tonight's agenda is it's quite packed. You've done really well as your first chair, to be honest. But it has been a packed agenda. Um, so, can, is, is there any way we can we can sort of have, have a review of what's expected of us over the next twelve months? Yeah, I think uh, generally from looking at this from the outside, I saw it and I thought if I chaired many meetings I share a lot of meetings and the agendas were this big you'd lose interest halfway through um, to be to be blunt uh, yes there's a lot of the stuff on there and we have to vote and we have to do that um, but again you know it's discussions and it is right that we talk about it but maybe they are just too big the agendas or maybe we don't meet often enough and these agendas need to be so you know if the tasks are too big for per, per session, maybe we need more sessions. I don't know, I'm just putting it out there. Is that possible? Uh, yeah, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, this committee is scheduled for, I think it's six meetings per year, August, uh, no, that's a private meeting, sorry, uh, September, October, February, March, uh, and this one here, so six, uh, it ultimately, I'd, I'd support a bit at your discretion as chair um, to hold additional meetings, uh, to liaise with democratic services to uh, uh, facilitate that, and I'd advise speaking to uh, Andrew Wood uh, to just ensure, see what, what can be moved from specific item, uh, agenda items that are set on the timetable uh, to those specific meetings. Uh, but I'll be fully in support of at least one additional meeting, yeah. Thank you, Chair. I was just going to say that uh, this, this agenda, the June agenda, is probably you know, twice as big as probably the rest of the year. So we, we probably need to look at the June agenda and perhaps move some of those re reports around. But yeah, we'll re review it and, and come back to the committee at the next meeting just to uh, make sure we've got the, 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 right, um, the le right level. And if in, obviously you can ta then take a view if we need an extra meeting in the diary. What we'll do, we'll, pu we'll put next June's a committee on the end so we get a feel for the, the whole year going forward thank you. Bins on. Right. Uh, right. Um, the statement is in accordance with the provisions of local authorities, executive arrangements, meetings and access to information, England, regulations 2012 and section 100A, brackets full, of the Local Government Act of 1972. The press and public be excluded from the meeting during the consideration of the following business on the grounds that it involves the likely disclosure of ex except information, exempt information, as defined in paragraph 3, part 1 of Schedule 12A of the Act, and the public interest in withholding information outweighs the public interest of disclosing the information to the public. 
Okay. Obviously, you've read those and you understand that. Thank you. Vote. There you go. Okay.